We were, or I am, or we were. I have a few more snapshots from a that vocational, vacational area that we were visiting. Wherein, if you recall, that men's minds discover new worlds, new neural worlds, in as much as they are also simultaneously inventing them in the kind of examples that we were using. And that connected with that kind of displacement process wherein men are becoming civilized, wherein men collectively think and believe things that the individual could not, and it step by step, a little further and a little further moves man away from his older primary base. Those two connected. And we more or less left, if your memory serves us correctly. <laughs> While we were noting how the normal civilized collective thoughts and beliefs of man take on almost an aura of another entity. Now, I was calling it a person the other night to try and make it simple, but it's like in the law sometimes they call it an agency, which is another story, but... You know, and the law doesn't fool around. The law does not. The law has almost no room for metaphysics and weird people. Well, unless they're attorneys and wearing hats and it's on. You know, it's after some kind of seminar. The law is not spiritual. So, you got to understand. An agency is just like it's something else. I mean, it's not a brick and it's not a car. It's just. I said entity or person. But surely, by some of what we were talking about last time, you got. You must have some feel because it literally has to be put into words of ordinary people and it comes out the full spectrum you can fill it in between is almost covered between saying culture God and nature because it is a sensation now of course very the religious people those still fulfilling that part in life's body they will insist if someone heard that they'd say well you're just beating around the bush, oh, you're saying that there's God, and that we're all, we've got little souls, and our souls are wired up to respond to the gods and the cosmic forces, and so, we, yes, we all do know this, something greater than us. Suffice it to say that everyone has a sensation, the nervous system itself, a toaster. Are we going to par allegory ourselves to death? A toaster in some way, at least in the south, let's say, a toaster all right, up north. A toaster has some awareness, maybe not knowing the name, but it has some awareness of Con Ed <laughs> or Guff Power and Electric here in the South. So humans have an awareness that there is something else. You know, everybody's been saying that all the way from Plato on up and down. But I am trying to get you to see that there is a reality to it that is based on that which is taking place inside of you. The reliving of that kind of history of the growth of the nervous system, that what other people would call God, the easy one. I mean, that's just the easy, just to lump it all on God, of whatever religion, whatever nature, that yes, something else is going on. Not just the bad news, not just saying, well, my wife ran off and left me. I lost my business, and God should have looked after me. Or I'm about to die, and boy... I don't think I'll hold that loss of business 10 years ago against God. You know, I, maybe he didn't actually do it. That is the easiest way to say, well, there is obviously something else. But there is, within the nervous system of those even wired up, to be non-religious. And especially those that have the ability to see across some wide spectrum and not limited to that kind of polarized thinking of whether it's God or not. It is simply the sensation of the toaster knowing, hey... It may not know Con Ed, and it may call Con Ed God, and for all I know, Con Ed may be God. But the toaster knows, knows. Not because of psychological reasons, because uh, I'll admit to you, even though I use the example, uh, there are some toasters that do not even have an average IQ that, I mean, some of you would make them look. So we're not talking about some sort of innate intelligence, but there is a wired in awareness that there is something else. And when men collectively, when they become civilized, and every little thing we could talk about, which we're not going to, but every example of civilization, everything that is the secondary world of man, everything that is a product of this, 
comes about at the ordinary level through the combined efforts of people. I know we've hit this once or twice, but it is so slippery. Is that the thoughts and the beliefs, looking at from the view of religion at one end and everything that would go down the spectrum over to non-religion, that is science, and call it all the way from beliefs to thought, which is still, you got to remember, a product of the human mind. Forget all the soul and the heart and all that. It's this, because you take away a man's mind, you take away Billy Graham's mind, Jimmy Swigert. Take away their mind, and you got no more church. You got no more religious person. Now, I'm sure that religious people, especially those that had some kind of vested interest in their ministry, could explain that away. But just note, you can be the most religious, the Pope. Let the Pope get a, let the Pope get a bad gorder, and, and there is no more religion. You cannot be religious and have a gorder in the right place. <laughs> you cannot be religious without a mind, without a functioning intellect. Now, I know they talk about the soul and all that, and I'm not going to be cheap enough to say, show me where it is because they can't find it. If I can tell them this, I say, I know where the brain is, and go up there and snip that, and the Pope will not be religious. He won't necessarily be anti-religious, but he'll be kind of a, maybe a turnip Pope. He'll lay there and you can dress him up, but the man is no longer religious. Now, back to the, what I want you to see is individually, at the ordinary level, the individual mind of one man, the way it works, just see it. I'm not, it's not because I say so, it's in operation. The history that's within your genes is right before your. Individually, man would not be civilized from all sorts of ways I could describe it, you know, from a very crude physical way, that one guy would never be civilized by himself. And I could do it very crudely, physically, tangibly, by saying... He's got to get with two or three other people or he's got no reason to be civilized. He'll do anything he wants to. He'll spit in the floor of the cave. He'll do anything. But you get several people together and that seems to be group pressures. I'm going to tell you what it is. I've, I've already told you. That which seems to be civilization, that which is called civilization, that which we sometimes refer to operationally as the secondary world as opposed to that primary world, it comes about through collective thought and belief. It just simply is. And I'm not going to, I know that you don't want to waste time and try to improve it since it can't be. It is simply the way it operationally works. That groups of men get together and they can collectively believe things that one man can't believe. One man, play with the rally one more time, if one man was alone, truly alone, and yet he had a fully functioning intellect, we could have it both ways, and he was there alone, and he was as mentally sophisticated and complex as you are, and he was alone, he would never come up with the idea of God. Just trust me. He just would not. He would never come up with the idea of mathematics either. It takes a collective effort of humans to produce the secondary world. And so it is not invalid to say that a group of men can believe that which one man cannot. And that's not an attack. So that doesn't mean that, well, religion is some kind of mass folly. Because if you said that, then you've got to say science is a mass hysteria. And it's not. It is the secondary world, but it is invented. It is not discovered. Or if you won't call it discovered, it is coevally invented as it's being discovered. I guess that's almost up to speed. So that's where we left off, right? Note that no matter what it would be called, I'm sure I gave enough examples to jog your memory of society, culture, religion, civilization, that no matter what label is applied to the output, to the end result of collective thought and collective belief. No matter what it is called, if it's called nature, if it's called civilization, if it's called culture, if by whatever name it goes, this kind of collective intellectual efforts of mortal groups is in direct service to life's interest. If you... We, 
I know we've mentioned that once several nights ago, but once you get some grip on that, it changes the perspective. This sounds awfully like psychology or philosophy. It would affect how you feel. It would affect if you could do this while simultaneously monitoring your own intellect's workings. It would affect the way you hear your own brain, your own partner talking to you about the criticism, the follies, the ironies of ordinary life. Because they are. That is part of the energy that runs that ordinary life. But if you understand that no matter what's going on, that all collective groups of people, in the name of science, in the name of religion, in the name of sports, arts, they are serving directly, collectively, the needs of life. This crudely gets rooted about periodically throughout history. Well, it's always around if you want to read it of some sore head somewhere. It's never in the mainstream of the collective thought and belief system. But it's always somebody saying things like, uh, this is a big joke. Life's just a big joke. It's some kind of the gods got drunk and they invented us and they put us together and they said, hey, there's kind of some kind of serious business going on here. And they're sitting back laughing at this. Or that we are slaves on some kind of farm. There's one that used to pop up every now and then. That we're, you know, we're sheep on some great cosmic farm. We don't know it. We're sheep that can talk and think. And all these dreams about, yeah, when you die, you go to heaven. Hell, when you die, they're going to eat you. They're going to fry you. You're going to become lamb chops. Somebody's always saying that. Seriously. There's always some philosopher, somebody sitting around in a coffee shop somewhere, you know, caffeine out of their mind, and they come up with these kind of ideas. But notice, and you can, if you hear it in a certain way, you can go reasonably. You can hear it and go, well, hey, that makes as much sense as God or you know, the Catholic Church or Buddhism. It makes sure. But notice, there's never been any danger. The churches have not had to band together and fight this kind of heresy. People can hear it individually and go, you know, that's true. That could very well be true. Reasonable, intelligent people can hear, well, we're nothing but... We're some kind of domesticated animals on some kind of invisible, maybe a higher dimensional farm, and they're just fattening us up. In some way, since we learn how to talk or something, they give us these dreams about, well, when you die, boy, are you going to have it made. Good. We're fools. We're just some kind of dumb sheep. Individuals all over the world can hear some version of that and go, that's not all that funny. But notice... Individually, it doesn't count in the individual world, in the uh, external world, in the civilized world. Collectively, men have never had such an opinion. They cannot hold such a view. I was just pointing out that that is a kind of continuing, very crude and inoperative example, reflection of what I was describing as being the fact that no matter what something is called, culture, nationalism, Provincialism, uh, race identification, sexual identification, anything that groups. Now, I know the individuals in it do it, so don't get confused. But anything that a group professes to be of some importance, that yes, we are all Albanians here. Yes, we're all North Dakotians. And with the kind of ordinary, proper pride which is belief. That functionally ends up apparently being a source of contention, of conflict between groups. The one group says, we are, for very good reason, Buddhist. Somebody says, we are, for very good reason, uh, Shintoist. We are Croatians and we are Serbs and never the twain shall meet. And it seems to be a kind of place wherein unprofitable differences of beliefs hit head on. And all it is, at another level, is all of these groups collectively serving the interest of life. 
And if you do not see that there is another interest, and you don't have to be mystical, you don't have to say like ordinary religious people would, well, hey, I believe all that because I believe God has a good, he got some great plan for this. Well, what might it be? Well, hell, I don't know, but I just know he does. Another reflection of what I'm saying. And so you don't have to know anything specific, but once you can see, once your own nervous system can feel that no matter what's going on, remember collectively, out there, whatever's going on out there under whatever name, no matter how to you or other people, no matter how admirable this one effort may seem, or no matter how fulfilling, no matter how promising, no matter how righteous, no matter how charitable this philosophy over here may be, and no matter how the individual participants may seem to gleefully roll in it and just enjoy the hell out of being charitable. And, of course, being uncharitable, those who don't appreciate it and all that kind of stuff, where Captain Irony slips into your party and realizes, well, they don't need me. In all of those things, the participants may verbally uphold the banner of whatever it is. They may say that we thought of this. In fact, I was there in the beginning. I helped establish this particular effort. Until you realize that everything in the secondary world, everything in the civilized world is serving life's needs directly in collective thought and belief, which is about all you've got. Until you understand that, then nothing makes any sense. Just as it's not supposed to. In other words, the only conclusion you come to is, Jesus, this place is nuts. Or, Jesus, this place is evil. This, this life is a joke. A bit further on with that. The way you've got the kind of well, all of the normal aspects of civilization, which would amount to any hobby a man could have for which life did not furnish you, remember. As Kairuk put it, that all hobbies are legitimate except those life furnishes you for, which is all sense of morality and uh, especially morality that seems to have negative payoffs such as hangovers and you know, withdrawal symptoms from drugs and... Uh, aftermath of sexual pleasures that require you going to the hospital. <laughs> so <laughs> that is kind of like normal. Not from my view. <laughs> That's kind of like the normal aspects of mass civilization. That is simply hobbies that life does not furnish people for. Now, anytime life furnishes you for what you're doing, this is off the track because in a sense of nobody's business but yours and it's down there, not most of you businesses, but if you have a hobby and life furnishes you for it, forget God and all that. Well, how about your body? How about you? But if life furnishes you for the hobby, eh. of course, none of us want to think about that in certain areas, I'm sure, speaking for some of you. But Considering all of the hobbies, the civilized activities for which life does not furnish people. And that's, that's everything. It's what was the first part of that Kairut that said all hobbies are legitimate except those that life furnishes you for. It's, again, that the world is big enough for everybody because it has to be. It is that no matter how dumb may seem to be to you, the fine hobby of collecting two-by-fours from all over the world. <laughs> if the people doing that are not suffering in some way, if they wake up every Sunday morning with a head full of splinters or something. <laughs> you know, you know. No matter how inane may be that hobby, really it is quite legitimate. As long as life is not furnished, it may not... Be, I don't know how many people in the world since I made it up actually collect two by fours, but now probably somebody does. And so it's, and so it's obviously no great need that life has. But whatever it is, whatever, no matter how silly it is, somebody who believes they're religious in a particular nomination or somebody who is interested in a specific kind of music or a certain kind of art or collecting clothes, whatever it is, 
no matter how large or small, and of course the larger it is, I should, I should speak for itself, the more widespread, but no matter what it is, if the person is not being punished for it, it's legitimate. That is, it is a normal, it is in some small way, at the very least, some functional part of civilization. It is serving, to varying degrees, the direct interest of life. Forget the individual, because if you stay on the individual, then you are going to be an individual yourself, and you're finally going to look around and say, well, I have tried to be broad-minded about this. But I'll be down if I'm going to share a ride to work every, every morning with a man who collects two-by-fours and won't shut up about it. And that's the way you feel. You just finally decide. You can get other people to agree with you. We're going to have to put Ralph in some other car. I'm not going to ride with somebody who collects two-by-fours and he tries to get... You know, the man is nuts. They are legitimate. They are serving life's interest. And they may not be serving yours, obviously. I mean, you're getting so upset about two-by-fours, I don't know why you don't calm down. It's no big deal. It's not but one or two people doing it. I mean, what's the chances, what's the odds of you ending up in a carpool with them? So, chill out. All of the legitimate activities of civilization, all the hobbies of the individuals that are not, that the individual is not being punished for life for pursuing them, they are all legitimate, they are all useful. That is, I was trying to get somewhere more specific, well, how about hurry up? Okay. That's the okay finger, isn't it? Serving life's interest directly, the way in which you're speaking now. You could put it another way and say that that is, that it is properly moving an ordinary man. At least another step away from his old, uncouth self. It doesn't matter what the hobby is. Again, saying, I mean, there's your cutoff. There's no other way. Surely you hear it. It's nothing complex. Whatever you're doing, which we normally just call a hobby, whatever you're pursuing, if life does not punish you, if you do not have a hangover from it, in the full sense of the word, if life is, is not punishing you for it, you are serving life's needs directly. And one of the things that you are specifically serving that flows through you individually is that this hobby, no matter how ridiculous somebody else's may seem, and of course, I'm sure there are probably people in the world so blinded, so narrow-minded in their view that they probably suspect that your hobbies are suspect. All of the hobbies that are legitimate, that life does not punish a man for, they are serving to take that man one step further away from his old, feral, more basic nature. It's a fact. Look at the difference. Well, you, surely you people hear it, but I don't mind bringing it. The difference between trying to collect, trying to collect uh, first folios of Mozart's works as opposed to, let's say that was one man's hobby. And let's say that as far as you're concerned, the classical period of music was probably the most overrated. But let, and so let's say that your hobby is at least twice a week getting as drunk as you can and without going to jail. Let's say. <laughs> or trying to get cocaine in your local neighborhood uh, at reasonable prices. And in fact, if you can, being able to cheat the dealers. You understand? Well, it's not just funny. It's so obvious in a certain way when but not just in a way that you normally have a religious outline or some psychological paradigm to go by. It is down to the most basic, even nonverbal level, that all hobbies, all secondary activities, remember we're talking about everything besides eating, eating, not dining, eating, just everything to keep you alive and to keep the race alive, sex, eating, out of the... Everything else is a secondary interest that a man is pursuing. Everything else is civilization. And all of those other activities, if they are legitimate and they are not self-punishing, then all of those are serving initially to every individual, and of course collectively, but individually, is it is removing that person at least one more little step away from their 
more primitive past. And it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with culture. That's not it. But notice, if we were just ordinary people or trying to pass thereof or for, and we said, well, now what would be the most uplifting? What would be the most civilizing hobby to have of the two that you just recently mentioned? Uh, being interested in Mozart or getting drunk? And if you just tried to pull yourselves together and straighten your shorts out and went, well, it had to be Mozart. I mean, because how is getting drunk and taking drugs, but how is getting drunk, how is that in some way a civilizing influence? Well, it's not. There's no way you can make it a civilizing influence. Contrary, that's not why people drink. They, they drink, by and large, to try and kind of, I know they explain it other ways, to revert to a more uncouth state, which one of the neat things about alcohol is it hardly ever fails if that's what you want. <laughs> You, you can depend on it more than you can, the prayers of Oral Roberts. But if you want to be pissed and uncouth and you drink, I don't know. I, I hear tales that, uh, what are they it's called, the National Association of Liquor Retailers. There's only been one person in the last, whatever it is, 75 years in the United States that ever went back to a liquor store and complained that what they bought did not get them drunk enough when they tried. So. Back to the converse. To say that all hobbies, all civilized activities serve directly, without it being known, but they serve directly life's interest. If they're not self-pernishing. And part of that interest, as it seems to reflect to the individual, is it makes the individual, or moves him, at least one step further away from his own older, uncouth self. Now, I'm sure I've good enough. Comma. But now, these same kind of group activities, hobbies, interests, these same kind of group thoughts and beliefs, the same kind of group, collective, theories, plans, formulas, systems, that indeed takes the ordinary man individually, and each and every time it is, whether you can perceive it or not, each civilized, each collectively produced interest that a man in life pursues, collecting stamps. Or if he gets tired of that, takes up you know, coins. Whatever it is, no matter how it seems to you, it indeed is a civilizing influence in that it drags him more and more into the secondary world. It removes him at least some teeny weeny step further away from his old, feral, basic, primary self. Those same group thoughts, beliefs, ideas, formulas, plans, however, would take someone of a potentially revolutionary mind, and what they do is it drags them like one step away, one step more away from the closet door. It drags you one step further away from any possible escape from a kind of finite thinking. That the very things that you're a fool, which I assume you're not, I'm just doing that for dramatics, that you're a fool, that is your ordinary. That if you still have any serious carping and complaints and railing out against the stupidity of society, then, you know, Jesus, you don't know, you're just a cheerleader and you're too dumb to know it. There is nothing wrong that's going on out there. Society has never made a mistake. Life does not make mistakes. Well, if it does, it buries them in such a way that well, you should know. You should know. So the group thought, the way we put it the first time, of course, was that it takes collected, collective thought and belief, or it takes groups of people to collectively think and believe things that are necessary that the individual cannot. So that's one way to put it, that it takes it, and it does, it requires it. But another way to look at it, changing somewhat this rhetorical structure and view, is what that does with individuals at the ordinary level is indeed progressive. It is indeed beneficial because all such activities arising from group thought, group beliefs, 
all of those take the individual at the ordinary level and they make him more civilized. They take him one step further away from his less predictable self, his more basic, his cruder, etc. self. But if you get outside of that, if it's someone attempting to do whatever this is, to be able to think outside the ordinary limits, those very things are new restrictions. And it's not that you're right and they're wrong. But if you're going to go by, if you're in any way going to accept, if you're in any way, there's no other way to say it because it sounds like that you've got to battle it, but you do not. You just have to understand that that, to see it for what it is and the purpose it serves, which is proper, and not stay simply with everything that has been produced collectively, which is everything that we normally say is out in the city, whether ordinary people thought it came from God or Is, if it was products of group thought, it is restrictive to you. It's, well, you could say, well, if you're going to think what everybody else thinks, you might as well be everybody else. <laughs> is that what you want? Uh, and some normal people, some normal minds said, well, not exactly, but you're close. What I'm going to be. It's like everybody else, but just a little bit better. Oh, and for them to realize it. Can't forget that. All right. Okay. Well, that about wraps it up. Let's go have a drink. And then we'll be all right. <laughs> then you can imagine. Well, I'm awfully close. Not only to being better because I am a little bit better. I say it in all humility, says you. But uh, a few drinks and... Uh, I begin to see some promise over the horizon where my local civilization, at least, may be coming to their collective senses, and they may begin to realize the exceptional nature of yours truly, says yours truly, not me. There was a, a guy who couldn't seem to make it into a car route, by the way. <laughs> And he keeps bugging me, so I'm going ahead and get this out of the way. He just, I don't, he couldn't make it in there. But he had this to say. And this is a quote. He said that civilization is a person, semicolon. The secondary world is a person, comma. And the only thing lacking is you being a person. <laughs> End of quote, and I hope he's happy. I want to note something else as fast as we can, that there's another connection between this kind of displacement process, you understand, that every time um, humanity in groups, whether it's small groups or large groups, is they collectively discover new worlds and coevally invent them. As they do that, this kind of displacement process, and it moves them one step further away from whatever the origin was of this new hobby. You know, stamp collecting, let's just make it easy, is an outgrowth of, of eating, back when people start, you know, fighting every day, every minute, every hour for food, and then part of the civilization can be described from certain sociological, cum, agricultural methods, methods of storage. People got smart enough to think, wait a minute, this food that we got that we found today, it took us five days to find it, this stuff that we just eat normally and we wander off, I got a great idea. Somebody said, what? He said, why don't we take it with us? And then we can eat it tomorrow. And they were, as I think they said back then, sorely confused, but then amazed. Like, I, right. This kind of displacement process did everybody lose their place. I was trying to show that that sort of thing, the displacement, that stamp collecting, collecting... Uh, fabrication, glass eggs, collecting anything you can see as the hoarding of food. So no matter what the hobby is, as long as it is not self punishing the hobby in some way is a displacement. Not in any negative sense, I just made up the term, but it is a removal from somewhere of those kind of three, or however many you want, I just made it simple, those three basic primary needs to keep humanity alive.
there's a connection between that displacement process and the collective thinking and believing of humanity, which unfailingly must divide all of the mental territories into two, into that which is properly believed and thought and into that which it is not. And there is a little subtle corner that I've been hiding and maybe it'll work out just right to do it in four minutes. Even when in the ordinary world, the ordinary level of civilization and thought, even when they seem, at least in passing, seemed almost forced to make some kind of reference to a third territory in the secondary events rather than just what is true or false or what is proper and improper. And there's a prime example, we were living through a heyday of it, is pollstering. That you suddenly read a poll, whether it be about politics or nowadays they poll evidently about everything. You know, what do you think about people taking polls? You look down, and we're talking about, and I'm making light of that because this is now serious business. Politicians, as you know, commercial enterprises pay big bucks. And so you look down at a poll and it's as though at the secondary level, this is just a great example, that in passing, the secondary world is forced to make some note of a third possibility. So they'll say, whatever the poll was about, they'll say, well, we have... Uh, Forty-two percent pro. Then I got a calculator and going to try to trip me. You've got forty percent pro. You've got thirty-nine percent con, and you've got nineteen percent undivided. Now that's you're always going to find that in a poll, whether you ever thought about it or not. They cannot divide it. In the two territories, never worked, or I've never seen it. But it's always 42% pro. percent con. 19% undecided. Then you look down in the article, or the next day, wherever it is. The pollsters then do the follow up on the pros and the con division. Whereas one might legitimately, might properly, at first think, wait a minute, what they were going to do, without any doubt, they're going to pursue, they're going to follow up and question the undecided because that, may I say, most likely is the area from which the swaying and deciding votes are eventually going to come. But do they? Think about it. It's a fact. I mean, you read it right there. They'll give all the details about all the polling, all the you know, safeguards and what they did. And then they'll say, and so then our follow-up, we sent people back into the field, we kept the people's names, and we told them we wanted to come back in a week or so after they'd had the new, you know, the new Hampshire primary and see what they thought. And they'll go back to the pros and the cons. I mean, they may, may end up talking to somebody from over there, but that is not the thrust. The thrust is to go back to the pros and the cons. And they act as though the third group doesn't exist which is one way I could start out, but I try to take a more harsh, pushy approach and say that you would be well within your intellectual expectations to think, well, wait, if they're going to follow up, do additional questioning, try to investigate, I mean, the obvious place is to go to the undecided, that third group, those 19%, because they're the ones somewhere in there most likely, to say the least, most likely the deciding, the switchover, Vote is going to come from there, but they treat it almost as though it does not exist. Look at We got another minute or so? We don't? It's almost as though life treats this, the third group, the third measurement, as though it's a secret. And if it's not a secret, it treats it almost as though, well, all right, if anybody suspects it, let them call it God. That's the easier one. And I was going to say beyond all that that the newer revolutionist, though, knows a little secret of his own. 